I'm going to be talking about one of the problems I work on in phylogenomics. So phylogenomics is basically how do you get evolutionary trees from genome scale data. And there's many interesting problems there. And uh, because I only have 20 minutes, I will only tell you really about one. OK, so a species tree, everyone knows what a species tree looks like. It's where um, we're trying to depict the evolution of some set of organisms, in this case, human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan. And this is saying that human and chimp have a more recent common ancestor than they do to gorilla and orangutan as they outgroup. How do we estimate this kind of species tree and why do we care? The reason we care is that it answers many questions both about basic biology and about many things about biology. It, from things like, you know, what, what, is this, what is the structure and function of this particular protein from human migrations to an analyzing metagenomic data and to clinical applications, you know, des designing flu vaccines. There's many applications of evolution and of, of phylogenies, which are the trees that represent the evolutionary history. The, the problem is, of course, getting at these evolutionary trees because we can't look backwards in time. But if we have them, they give us a context in which we can answer many things in biology. And there's this very famous quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And then there's this second quote that says that nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of phylogeny. So I'm going to be talking about phylogeny estimation, which is going to give us an insight into evolution, which gives us insight into biology. And that's sort of the end of the discussion about biology. And henceforth, it's all computational. Okay, so if you're hoping to see more biology, my apologies. Okay, so this is going to be a model of DNA sequence evolution. There's a tree, and we have a DNA sequence that's evolving down the tree. And this tree, remember, think of this as human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan. There are these organisms that have these genome sequences. And we're looking at how this genome sequence is evolving through these different organisms over evolutionary time. So. We have speciation and changes. We have more speciation and more changes. And we have more speciation and more changes. And every time I change, I'm highlighting the letter that's changing. But this evolutionary model doesn't change the sequence length. So if you start off with a sequence of length 100, it's always of length 100. And so you end up getting sequences at the leaves of the tree. And from the sequences at the leaves of the tree, you're going to try to reconstruct the tree. Now, you don't know the tree. You just get to look at the sequences at the leaves. The only way to have this make sense is to have some kind of mathematical model that describes the evolutionary process as something that's happening, a random process that's operating on a tree. You don't know the tree. You know something about the random process. And you use what you know about the random process to estimate the tree. OK, so you don't know the tree but you're going to try to reconstruct the tree from the sequences at the leaves. One thing you'll notice is that the tree that you reconstruct is not rooted, and that's just because the models of sequence evolution are time reversible. You cannot locate the root. But you can locate everything but the root if you have enough data with probability converging to one. OK, so this is now a statistical estimation problem that we're going to try to address. But you'll notice that I said that this model says the sequences don't change length. Everyone who's ever looked at biological data knows that that's not realistic. So what's going on here is we have to address that. Nevertheless, even the simple version of given sequences construct the tree is a grand challenge. Every approach that anyone's ever tried that made sense amounted to one of those computational grand challenges that everyone is troubled by. And maximum likelihood is the canonical example of a well-known computational grand challenge in phylogeny. OK, what about phylogenomics? Phylogenomics, you're looking at s genomes from, a cr from many different species, which means that the DNA data that you have available to you is larger. You have whole genome data, potentially. Can we use whole genome data to get at the tree of life? That's the hope, except that whole genome data has even more problems than single gene data. You have what's called gene tree heterogeneity. Different parts of the genome have truly different histories. So even though there can be a true underlying species tree, the different parts of the genome can have different histories. And these differences can be due to multiple causes, including something called incomplete lineage sorting, which is a population level process. Uh, also horizontal gene transfer, also gene duplication and loss. So multiple causes, but the key point is that there can be a true underlying species tree, and yet each part of the genome can be different 
from another part of the genome, and it can look like it's just a mess. Okay, so phylogenomic pipelines, they start with gathering your data and figuring out what part of this genome has a relationship to what part of another genome that's called homology detection. After you have done all the homologies, then you're going to try to figure out the multiple sequence alignments, which is really what I'm going to talk about. But then after you do multiple sequence alignments, you get gene trees using maximum likelihood on your sequence alignments. And now you have all of these different gene trees, and you're going to try to reconstruct the species tree. Okay? So there's a long pipeline. And then at the very bottom, you answer the biology. So everything that you do in this pipeline affects the biology that you come up with. Your understanding of the biology that you're looking at is going to be impacted by errors that you make anywhere. So everything that happens early causes bigger problems than the things that happen late. It turns out that multiple sequence alignment is one of the biggest problems. And it's the topic of my talk today. Um, but computational grand challenges, everything in phylogeny that's worth doing is technically NP-hard. NP-hard means uh, non-deterministic polynomial time. You don't need to know that. But what it really means is don't expect to solve it exactly. So NP-hard problems, uh, you're going to need to rely upon heuristics. Exact solutions are completely infeasible except for very small data sets. Parallelism helps, but it does not, in fact, make a qualitative difference. Because the number of trees grows exponentially with the number of species, parallelism does not affect that exponential growth. So we need to deal with the fact that we have these hard optimization problems. We can't solve them exactly. Parallelism won't change that. We need to come up with really effective techniques that can deal with the fact that we'd like to solve our problems exactly. We can't. So we have to do something else. Um, and then there's this big data complexity. Big data complexity for me is things like you're, you're estimating under one model, but what's really going on is something more complicated. You have errors in your input data. You have missing data. You have all sorts of uh, mishigas, and you have to make sense out of it. Okay. So the, the motivating projects, two phylogenomics projects I was on, one was for birds, one was for plants, um, just to give you an idea. The avian phylogeny, uh, phylogenomics project, we published, I think, eight papers in, in science um, a year and a half ago. The first challenge was that we took these 14,000 different genomic regions, we concatenated the alignments into one big matrix, and we tried to solve maximum likelihood. Now, it's only approximately 50 species, but they're very long alignments. So guess how long it took? Well, you can see, more than 250 CPU years. So this is not necessarily a big data set and yet it's 250 CPU years on supercomputers around the globe. Okay, so that's one problem. Another problem was massive gene tree heterogeneity. That massive gene tree heterogeneity meant that the concatenation analysis, in fact, wasn't necessarily the right thing to do. We needed to take gene tree heterogeneity into account. Okay, the next project, the 1,000 plant transcriptome project. This is now plants. It's transcriptome data rather than genome data, but in essence, the computational challenges are fundamentally the same. We had more species but fewer taxa. Uh, the first challenge um, in our next analysis, because the first paper is already out in PNAS, but our next analysis needs us to do alignments and trees on more than 100,000 sequences at once. 100,000 sequences, not 50, not 100, but 100,000. So this is the scale of the project we're trying to analyze. Um, and again, massive gene tree heterogeneity. So three of my favorite grand challenges, okay, just three of them. Um, multiple sequence alignment, large scale multiple sequence alignment, extremely interesting problem. Phylogenomics, which is making sense out of this gene tree heterogeneity. And the third one is just super tree estimation. If I can get species trees on subsets, can I combine them? Very interesting problems from computational and statistical standpoints. Today I'm only going to talk about multiple sequence alignment, but I wanted to tell you there's this other stuff, because the other stuff is really fun. Okay, so multiple sequence alignment. It's been identified as one of the important grand challenges from the National Academies Press. And I'm sorry, but the, the reference has disappeared down there. Okay, so you have sequences. They are different lengths. You're going to pull them apart so that they line up on top of each other, and what you get is something called a multiple sequence alignment. That um, thing can be done, of course, very simply, but to have it make sense so that it reflects evolution, 
means you're trying to do the same kind of thing as phylogeny estimation, which is look backwards in time. You can't do it except under like statistical models, and statistical estimation is extremely hard. All the optimization problems that have been posed are NP-hard. The data sets are very big. The current methods don't provide adequate accuracy. So, and many methods can't even run on large data sets. So here we have the consequences of these challenges to biology are that biologists will simply not analyze a lot of their data. They will say, this data set's too hard to align, I won't look at it. They'll say, this data set is too big, I won't look at it. They'll say, um, the problem is the data rather than the problem is the method. Once you start throwing out your data, you're, you're narrowing down what you can actually answer. And that has impact on what you can do with your data. The second thing is that if you use a bad method, on your data, because that's the other option, right? Keep the big data set, but use a bad method. You get bad results, and that has consequences for everything you want to say afterwards. It's well known, for example, that most alignment methods will compress the alignment, which will lead to a false positive detection of positive selection. That's one of the examples. So lots of consequences from using bad alignment methods on your data. OK, so scientific discoveries are jeopardized by the use of poor methods, or by the use of narrowing down the data you want to look at. So today's talk is multiple sequence alignment estimation, some methods that I've developed. One of them is called PASTA. It's basically a divide and conquer method that boosts another alignment method. Um, then the default PASTA and how well it works on data sets up to a million sequences. And then integrating a new statistical, um, an old statistical method into, into PASTA to create this new hybrid so that we can actually get even better accuracy. And it's this last thing that was, we did with, the, with our uh, allocation on blue waters. This is unpublished. Um, we just submitted it last night. Um, it can go to 10,000 sequences now. No reason it can't go to a million as well. OK. So I said sequences evolve. And my first model had sequences evolving without anything but substitutions. But that's not the only thing that happens. They also evolve with things called indels, insertions and deletions. Insertions and deletions change the sequence length. So this is an example of a top sequence that evolves into this bottom sequence. And as you can see, this purple stuff gets deleted, so it's not in the bottom sequence. This T changes into a C. And this T is inserted. So you take one sequence, you insert things, you delete things, and you make substitutions, you get another sequence. That's what's happening on a tree. And if you know what's happening on every edge of the tree, right? what's being deleted, what's being inserted, then you know the true alignment on every edge. right? Because you know how to align this sequence to this sequence. The purple stuff that got deleted is over dashes. This T changed into a C, so they're in the same column. This T was inserted, so it's below a dash. If you know the true evolution, you know the true pairwise alignment. If you know the true pairwise alignments on every edge, then transitivity gives you the true multiple sequence alignment. So you know the true alignment if you can go back in history. Okay. Um, so the true multiple sequence alignment is the transitive closure of the pairwise alignments. Now, how do we estimate trees? We take sequences that are not aligned. We do our best guess at aligning them. Then we take that alignment, we treat it as fixed, and we get a tree. It's two-phase method. Um, Co-estimation under a statistical model of sequence evolution that includes insertions and deletions would be better. But there are no scalable methods that do this. OK, so we're going to stick with the methods that are not about statistical estimation of alignments under models. Now, Let's do a simulation study and evaluate the accuracy of the alignments in the trees that you get from doing this kind of two-phase method. When you do a simulation study, you know the true alignment, you know the true tree, then you can compare the estimated alignment and the estimated tree to the true alignment and tree. This is the standard way that phylogeny is evaluated in the biology literature. OK, so we quantify error in the estimated trees by the bipartitions in the edges that should not be there. So this is an edge that splits S1, 2, and 4 from 3 and 5, this edge here. There's no edge here that corresponds to that bipartition. So we're marking it as a false positive. Similarly, this edge splits 4 and 5 from 1, 2, 3. 
It doesn't appear here. That's a false negative. Same number of each type of error when both trees are binary. And otherwise, what we have are true edges. This edge splits 1 and 2 from 3, 4, 5. It's also here. The error rate is the fraction of the edges that you got that you didn't want, only looking at the internal edges. So two-phase methods, we're going to do maximum likelihood on different alignment methods. Guess what we get? This is on 1,000 sequences. Easy models, hard models, everything has 1,000 sequences. This is the error rate. As you go from left to right, the error, error increases because the model becomes more difficult. Look how much the alignment error goes up. This is what you get on the true alignment. This is the true alignment running maximum likelihood. This is alignment error goes up. So big data sets with high rates of evolution, you get bad alignments and you get bad trees. So the key observation is that even though that's true, there are conditions where you can get good alignments. And the conditions are low rates of evolution. So low rates of evolution, you can get good alignments. High rates of evolution, get bad alignments. You get bad alignments, you get bad trees. So let's do divide and conquer. Let's take our best guess of a tree, divide it into subsets based upon the tree. Now we have small subsets, and we can apply our favorite alignment method to those small subsets, get better alignments, and then merge the alignments together. We do one iteration like that. We get a new alignment. We get a new maximum likelihood tree. We start again, and we repeat this process a few times in an iterative fashion. And this is how well it works in 24 hours. This was published in 2009 in Science. We then improved it got even better alignments in trees, and improved it again and gave you pasta. So everyone loves pasta. OK, so pasta can go to a million sequences. What I'm showing here is up to 200,000. So by the way, results on biological data are similar. Um, this is a comparison of pasta to satay and then to trees on the reference alignment. Almost perfect trees. OK, up. A different approach to doing alignment estimation and because of time, I'm going to skip how it works, but just show you the comparison to pasta. In terms of alignments, it's slightly better than pasta. In terms of trees, it's slightly worse, but very close. OK, running time, both of them, pasta and up, linear time, trivially paralyzed. What I have been showing you are pasta and up using mapped on subsets. Pasta divides into subsets and applies mapped, which is a standard alignment method, on the subsets. It then combines those alignments together. Up takes pasta and gets an alignment on a random sample. So these are just methods that boost other methods. So why don't we go ahead and try to boost the statistical alignment method, Balify. So Balify is the leading statistical alignment method. It's very accurate here. We're showing alignment accuracy better than pasta on 100 sequences and on 200 sequences, better than pasta. Um, but it's limited to small data sets. Its own readme says don't go past 50. It has been analyze, analyzed on larger data sets, but the largest is like 117, and that took many weeks. So let's stick it inside pasta and see how well it works. It's outperforming pasta. So you put Bellify instead of MAFT on subsets, and you get a better alignment than default MAFT. And mind you, nothing was better than default MAFT except up. So up we're going to use to go to 10,000 sequences, and this is what we get for 10,000. Up with pasta with Bellify is now better than default up. So we've made a better version of up. We've made a better version of pasta because we use Bellify instead of MAFT. The scalability is there. So on Blue Waters, this is trivially parallelized. There's nothing special about uh, Balify. Balify takes a lot of memory. It, it takes a lot of time. That's the worst part about it. It's like weeks of analysis. We only allowed it to go for 24 hours with 32 processors. But we got it to work. So lots of projects on Blue Waters are all characterized by this kind of divide and conquer, improving the accuracy of species tree estimation methods, improving the accuracy of metagenomic classification, improving the accuracy of protein structure prediction. We're always going after accuracy. We're doing a lot of algorithm design, exploration of the design space. That's what we really need Blue Waters for, is for the design of new methods. And we're also using it to al analyze biological data sets. So the Tree of Life has multiple grand challenges. I only told you really about multiple sequence alignment, but it's a fantastic area for anyone who likes hard problems. And the acknowledgments. Um, 
So Siavash and Nam were the two students from Texas who worked on pasta and up together. And this is uh, Mike Newt, who's been working on integrating Balify into pasta and up. And that's what we've been doing with our, our allocation. Thank you.